I hope you enjoyed this moment with us. And if you are our constant viewer, we like to appreciate you and we want to encourage you. Keep visiting, keep coming. We are here for you. If today is your first time um, tuning in, we'd like you to subscribe, to like, and to share this very video that you are watching. I believe very well that there are people in your contact that would like to hear this message. What is being talked about today. The blessing that you have had today, I hope there are people in your life that you want to share with and I'd like you to do that one. How many of you are blessed to be here this morning? And even you watching online? Amen. It's good that you are finding time and you are, you are, you are coming into the service if it, if it is online. We truly honor you. We pray that you find a day to come in person. In Jesus' name. We have been on a journey this um, in this season, we've been on a journey, and uh, I hope you people are taking notes now. What did we talk about first in this journey? Can you remember? Choosing life, amen, which means choosing, choosing Jesus. You choose Jesus, you choose life. That's what you've done, and you choose a particular lifestyle. That's what we talk about. That's why choosing Jesus must be very intentional. You cannot be born a Christian. You must come to a point where you intentionally decide to become one. And from there, you must decide to be disciplined according to his word. Because choosing Christ is choosing a particular lifestyle. You can make it. You cannot design it for yourself. You cannot choose the way you want to live. You can't. When you choose Christ, it's a package. He comes with a particular lifestyle that you have to live. And after you have chosen Christ, the next thing becomes you then becoming a new creation. Is that it? A new creation. Martha, you're taking notes. A new creation. So when you choose Christ, he gives you a particular lifestyle. That lifestyle is called, you are now a new creation. Amen? That's what they call being born again because a new life has been given to you. It's so simple. You choose Christ. You choose a particular way to live. That way you have chosen to live is what the new creation is. And for you to be able to live that life, there are two things you have to do. First, you have to repent from what we listed last week, the works of the flesh. You have to repent the works of the flesh. And we listed those works of the flesh. If you have not listened to that, I will encourage you to go back and listen to last week's sermon. You repent from the works of the flesh. And you repent to the fruits of the spirit. So from to. It's a journey. You're coming from somewhere. You're going somewhere, which is you are going towards bearing the fruits of the Holy Spirit. That becomes your new identity. It becomes your new identity. The fruits of the Holy Spirit then become your new identity. Now today, we are looking at after you have repented and you have taken on yourself a new identity, what's next? Next is you then have to be a living sacrifice. Look at your neighbor and say, a living sacrifice. A living sacrifice. Let us review. Number one, you do what? You choose life. Number two, you, you become a new 
in new creation, you have to repent from the works of the flesh to the works of the spirit. After that, your life then become a living sacrifice. Now, the concept of the living sacrifice in the old days, even before Christ came, and even in our cultures after Christ came, and even today there are certain cultures that are still doing that. So the living sacrifice in those days in certain cultures, someone will see a cause, like something is going wrong, and they will rise up for that which is going wrong. And they will try to talk about it and nobody listens. So what they will choose to do, they will choose to punish themselves until they gain the attention of people who should listen. There are cultures where people set themselves on fire to be consumed and burned. They choose to set themselves on fire. They have calculated the pain that is in it. Everything is considered and fostered into the fact that they are a living sacrifice. They are giving themselves to be sacrificed for the purpose for which they stand. As living, they are alive. They will go in the, in the public place and they will set themselves on fire as a living sacrifice that this thing must change. So the concept of, the, of a living sacrifice comes from that. And for us Christians, even Christ was a living sacrifice. He handed himself over fostering all the pain that we come with that and he says I'm still going to die so he showed us and he's given us an example of what it means to be a living sacrifice he could feel pain he could feel shame. He could feel everything or anything that you and I can feel, but he still chose to give himself. When you give yourself as a living sacrifice, it does not mean you are not going to feel pain. Now I'll tell you. But because you have chosen a particular lifestyle, You've also calculated the pain that comes with being a living sacrifice and you still choose to be one. You choose to go without friends if being a living sacrifice will make all the friends to go away from you. You also understand that, that they will go because Jesus did not hide it. He said, for many will forsake you if you make this choice. You choose to forego certain jobs and you know the consequences of those for, of forsaking those jobs but you choose to be a living sacrifice. People will do things that will hurt you physically. You will feel the pain. You choose not to respond because you are a living sacrifice. living sacrifice. You are alive but you make certain choices and you are even willing to go through the pain Aminata knowing very well that this is going to cause you pain but you still choose not to do it because you have considered yourself a living sacrifice. It's hard. It's not an easy thing to sit down and see someone insult you inside this boiling. Oh, you see, I'm a living sacrifice. I'm a living sacrifice. You think it's fun? No. 
No. You remember when Jesus went to Gethsemane? He said, Father, this cup, I don't want it. I am already beginning to feel the pain. His father said, no choice. You are a living sacrifice. Sometimes you think, uh, we think sometimes the Christian life is always going to be on cloud nine. The greatest deception ever. Clyde Noun, where is Clyde Noun cloud nine for you? It's not going to happen. They've been fooling you. It's a discipline of your flesh. It's a discipline of your flesh. Complete discipline of your flesh. Total discipline of every part of you. Particularly the mouth. Someone says something. Oh my God, you got one million words to say. You look at that person and say, my God. Ah, living sacrifice. I think we have been deceived of what it means to be a Christian. Big deception. People can just do everything this that they still call themselves Christian. I'm sorry, but the life of a Christian is a discipline. It's a disciplined life. You need to ask a prince or a princess whether they want the position that they are in, most of them will tell you they don't want it. Because it is a life given to you, you can't choose. You are confined and concealed in a certain way. The name is there as a prince, but there are certain things you cannot do. You are not allowed to wear whatever you want to wear. You are not allowed to go wherever you want to go. You are not allowed to eat whatever you want to eat. There are certain things you cannot do. It comes with honor, but greater discipline. Because you are prepared for something greater. So the Christian life is not just something you just come in. That's why you need to decide whether you want to be one or not. But once you make the decision now, it becomes a discipline life. Jesus already said how husbands should behave to their wives. You don't need to make your own laws. Jesus already said what women should be to their husbands. You don't need to make your own laws. You don't need it. How a child should be. Everything is given to you. The choice is for you to live it because you have signed up for this. But most of you honor your bosses more than Jesus. You honor, we honor our bosses more than, ah, let your boss say something. You see people shaking. They're going to lose the job now. But when it comes to Jesus, oh, it's Jesus. There is, an, there is a punishment that awaits you. Because he did not force you to be one. You chose to be one. It's a choice. Therefore, there is a living aspect and there is a sacrifice aspect. Romans chapter 12 verse 1. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies, offer, you're giving it. Amen? To offer your body as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God, this is your true and proper worship. Not just only offering yourself, but it must be acceptable. So there are four dimensions in this scripture. The first dimension is total surrender. Look at your neighbor and say total surrender. No, they are not hearing you. That's a very hard thing, total surrender. Total surrender. Total surrender. 
total surrender. Your individual life, your family life, your community life is a complete surrender. You live in that place of complete surrender. Now, the Bible says here, in favor of God's will, in favor of God's will, in favor of God's will. So completely surrendering yourself in favor of God's will. How does that happen? Because if something happened, you got two choices. One is God's will. One is the will of your flesh or the will of anybody. Your surrender is incomplete and total in, in the favor of what God wants. So whatever presents itself before you, your surrender should be in favor of the will of God. So the question you should ask yourself whenever something surrender, ask yourself, is this God's will? If it is not God's will, choose God's will. It's easy. Because your surrender is in, is in complete and total favor of the will of God. Now the battle then becomes, after you have found out what the will of God is, are you willing to do it? So something presents itself to you, Melissa, and you look at the Bible, and the Bible says, this is what you should do. Now you have to choose. Will you choose what the Bible says, or you choose what you feel to do? If you choose what you feel to do, you are walking in the flesh. If you choose what the Bible says, you are doing it in favor of the will of God. Does that mean it's not going to cause you pain? It will. I was sharing with someone this scripture and the person said, so you are trying to say that. Does that mean Christians cannot even get angry? I said, you got it wrong. That's how you people start to be deceived. Because that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says God recognized that you have flesh, you have emotion, you have everything. Get angry. The only thing the Bible did not permit is that don't let the sun set with the same. If you let the sun set, then that means you are now in your flesh. The sun should not set. But the Bible did not say don't get angry. Get angry. But the sun should not set. Find a way to fix it. The sun should not set. It's the discipline aspect. Now, how do we then know God's will? How will I know the will of God? Romans chapter 12, verse 2. How will I know God's will? The Bible said, do not conform to the pattern of this world. So there is a pattern that Paul is already making known. There is a pattern of the world. He said, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. When you are transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and prove what God's will is. So the transformation of your mind is what will help you to know what the will of God is. And what is that? You must be renewed. That is, you are now renewed from the works of the flesh to the works of the spirit. When that renewal happens, then you begin to know what the will of God is. But there must first be that renewal. And that renewal is that you have chosen, have decided to not live by the flesh, but to live by the spirit. To seek the fruit of the spirit. 
That's the first dimension. Renewal is the first dimension. Renewal of your mind, which is a complete surrender. You are surrendering to the will of God. Total surrender to God's will. God, if you say it, whether I know it, whether I, I believe it, whether I want to, it's not a question, but I will do what you say. I will do what you say in this matter. What you say I will do. You are in that room by yourself. You got your gadget in your hand. And those funny images are coming on. There you choose the will of God. There you choose the will of God. Someone treat you in certain way that you know that the way they are treating you is wrong. But you choose the will of God. You choose God's will. Because you've given yourself as a living sacrifice. And that means you're going to feel the pain. It's not just going to go away. You're going to feel the pain that someone has abused me. You're going to feel the pain someone has misused me. You're going to feel the pain in your body that I just want to watch this, this video so I can feel good. You feel the pain when you are not, when you have decided to stop that drugs, that addiction, you feel the pain, the craving, you can feel it, it comes inside you, it grips you, but you've made a choice. Your body feels the pain, but your heart has made the choice. Your body no longer captains your life, but the spirit captains your life. Is your body going to be in pain? Of course it won't be in pain. But you choose not to. But you choose to live according to the will of God. Amen? It's all part of it. It's all part of the discipline that God wants you to have. It's all part of what Paul says. You got to crucify your body. You got to pick your own cross. You have to follow him. It's all a part of it. The second dimension to that scripture is holiness. Today we don't talk about holiness. You can't talk, you talk about holiness, you are not a good pastor. There should be no reason why we should be Christians if holiness is, because holiness is the one that is being given to us. Holiness is what is being given to us. We must be holy. So holiness is a part of us. It's a part of us. We choose, the Bible says, holy, acceptable. As a Christian, you must be holy and acceptable. Well, that's a very big problem. That's a very hard one to say, to be holy. It's a very hard one. Holiness has two heads. Number one, it's not just about avoiding sin. But it's also the pursuit of righteousness. There are two heads to holiness. You avoid sin, you pursue righteousness. Avoid sin, pursue righteousness. So if you are apprehended by sin, your way out is to pursue righteousness. But in the first place, don't always give yourself to sin. Don't be apprehended by it. But if sin succeed in catching you, pursue righteousness. What does that mean? For no reason or reason well known to myself, but it may not be true, I insult this woman. I insult Elizabeth. I tell her a word. And then I'm done. I'm satisfied. My flesh is pleased. You know how some people can say? I will talk it. I will say it. Now you say it. Your flesh is satisfied two minutes. Two minutes. You say what you wanted to say in two minutes. Your flesh is satisfied. When you leave that place, you are rebuked by the Holy Spirit. That wisdom, that word you said to that woman was wrong. First, I have allowed sin by using a word I should not use. 
But now I've already done it. How do I pursue righteousness? I know now my outing in this one to please God is to come back to this woman and say, listen, what I told you was wrong. I was not meant to say, forgive me. That is pursuing righteousness. I have allowed sin to get a hold of me, but I can't allow it to sit. I have to deal with it that moment by coming and saying what I did to you was wrong and I'm sorry. It's a shame that I did it. I wasn't meant to do it in the first place. But when we harbor it, we have entered through sin and sin has held us captive. And we are not subjected to the word of God, to his will. So holiness is avoiding sin, pursuing righteousness. If you can do these two things, you will be okay. That's why repentance is critical. Repentance is critical. Don't let sin apprehend you. It's nothing, it's pride, it's just ego, that's all. You can destroy your future for one small pride today. Completely destroy it, your identity, everything dismantle. For just one small ego. You don't know where you are going to meet this person tomorrow. You people have a quarrel that you want to make big. Sort it out. Move on. I don't know where I'm going to meet you tomorrow. I don't know where my kids will meet you. Why can't I prepare my future but just allow myself to be trapped by emotion? He said this to me. She said that to me. Come on. Come on. Deal with it. Move on. Most of us can say, oh, I tell you, our actions, sometimes actions of people who come to church can clearly prove that they don't believe in heaven. We can just say it. Because if you truly believe heaven is real, let me tell you, most of us will not live the way we are living. But you don't know when you will die. But your life is full of all problems. You have enemies all over the place. Then you die now. Then you go to hell and say, God is. Huh? Do you believe in heaven? If you believe in heaven, you will not wait. Because heaven is more precious to you than that word someone told you, isn't it? Heaven should be more precious to you than, more than the way that person treated you, isn't it? Heaven should be more precious to you. If heaven is precious and it is real, you will not want to live one day in sin. But we say it. But since last year, that person, you still carrying it. Then you say heaven is real. And you are saying Jesus will come anytime. If he comes today, are you ready? If Jesus appear now, we, let's think heaven is real. Hell is real. Christ will come anytime. I think some people here, they have the, they have the secret code. When Jesus is coming, he will alert them. That's why they are keeping all grudges, living in sin, just doing all kinds of things and proud with it. You tell someone, forgive, I can't forgive. You can't forgive. Then you say heaven is precious to you. Then you say Christ will come anytime. You truly believe in that. That's why sometimes people can say Christians say what they don't believe. We say what we don't believe. I can tell you the grudge that is in some hearts. Today Christ appear, you won't go to heaven. But you still are feeling good with that grudge. You have not let go. The habits, the habits that are in us, that we are, I, I can't stop doing this, I'm struggling. <laughs> ah, God. You talk to people. Someone say, God have mercy. How does a woman know that she has been doing wrong? She wants to change now. She wants to live for God. Just because it says she has cancer, she will not live for over one year. Suddenly, she wants to change now. Everything must change. Should they tell you you have to die before you change? Don't you know that transformation is something that... Should, most of the things we are struggling with today, if the doctor say, if you don't stop, you will die, we will stop it immediately. We will stop it because, but that does not mean honoring God. That's not honoring God. You're doing it selfishly. Selfishly because doctors say you will die. You want to stop. 
But why can't you stop for the sake of God? Should they tell you? They don't need to tell you. They don't need to tell you. Most of the things we want people to tell us, nobody need to tell us. We already know it. We are just very stubborn. That's all. Nobody needs to tell. We know the truth. We tell our children the truth. We tell them every day. And then we turn our back. We do the same thing we say they should not do. And when people point it out, oh, you can't point it out. Then you become my enemy. Now when they say, let's pray for our enemy, I'm thinking about you. Because you told me the truth. The real enemy, we, that's why Satan is, is roaming about doing things. Because he's not our main enemy anymore. The enemy now is this brother because this brother told me something. This sister because this sister told me the truth. This has become, when they say, let's pray for our enemy. I think, Muna is my enemy. <laughs> huh? Let's say back to the sender now. Oh, we want to send all the team back to your true enemy. You have forgotten your true enemy. Because the devil is your true enemy. Not that sister or brother who came and trigger you. You are an angry person. I'm an angry person. That person just say a word, few anger. Where did the anger come from? From the person or from me? It's inside here. It's not in the person. All that person did was trigger. And I fueled up. And I blamed that person. But that person didn't put anger on me. Anger was in me. All the person did was to shake it. And the anger fueled. Jealousy was there. Envy was there. I just need him to see to wear. To, I just need to see him wear nice clothes, and he fuses up. And I go and buy it, even if it does not fit me. I'll buy it. Someone say, "God have mercy." Dimension number three: continuous offering, continuous offering, continuous offering. We continuously daily. Daily offering ourselves, ongoing offering of ourselves unto the Lord. Amen. We are a living. Every morning you, a Christian, wake up, have five minutes, sit down at the altar of your own house and say, God, today I'm a new creation. All is gone and I'm made new today. And count. What do I need to sort out? Sort it out because that day you don't know whether you're going to come back home. It's a continuous word, sacrifice. Continuously laying ourselves on the altar. It is from this word that the word sanctification came from. The word sanctification is two words, sent and efficate. The word efficate is the word a continuous process of making. Continuous process of making. Making what? Scent. So there is a continuum process of making you a scent. So scentification, it is the continuum work of God in your life to making you holy. So the God is working every day on you to make you holy. Every day God is working on you to make you holy. It's an everyday thing. It's not when you give your life to Jesus 20 years ago. It's every day. Because it's sanctification. Every day you have to wake up and reconcile with the Lord. Every day. Every day you must reconcile with God. Because you are sanctified every day. You and I are called saint. Paul wrote to the church. Imagine, no? I, uh, we're no longer going to call names again. Saint Paul, how are you, sir? Saint Susanna, how are you, ma? This is what we should be calling ourselves. It's not a type of a, Paul wrote a letter to normal Christians to so the church. He called them, hey, Saint. Saint Stephen, Saint Vivian, Saint Martha, yeah. Saint Muhammad. That's somehow Saint Muhammad. We should be calling ourselves Saint. That's what we have to call ourselves. Sent is what we need to call ourselves. 
Because that's what the Bible calls us. Sent. We are all sent. But the word sent now is an everyday thing. Everyday efficacious. Preparing yourself every day for the coming of the Son of God. For the coming of the Son of God. For the coming of the Son of God. Every day, as we go about our lives, seeking all that we want to have, which is a very good thing. I would like to see you live in one of the biggest houses. I would like to see you drive a wonderful car. There is no sin in it because the Bible says that he will reward us. But I want to tell you, it is not our target. Your target is every day you are prepared for the coming of Christ. When the Bible says that he will come like a thief in the night, there is a big concept behind it. And if you are not a Hebrew, you will not understand that. In the Hebrew tradition, when Jesus said, I'm coming like a thief in the night, the Hebrew people understood what that was. In those days, what happened is this. The father of the son comes to the father of the wife, the bride, and say, we're going to marry your daughter. We're going to marry your daughter. My son is going to marry your daughter. He does not know when we are coming. The daughter does not know when we are coming. He just got the information. My son does not know when he is coming. The only person that knows is me. That's why Jesus said, only the father knows. The only person that knows when this will happen is me. The father of the boy. Now, the responsibility of the father of the girl is to prepare the girl and let the girl know any time they will come to take you. Prepare yourself. Every day, prepare yourself. Every day, prepare yourself. Now, someone has asked for you. Don't miss this. Don't blow it off. Prepare yourself. I don't know how long I will take to decide, but then I go and tell my son early in the morning, today you're going to get your wife. That's the only time my son knows now. You're going to get your wife today. Let's go. And we come, we knock at your door. You open, you see me. Behind me is my son. Your daughter should be ready. If not, you miss it. That's why Jesus said, I'm coming because we are the bride. He is the groom. Only his father should know when he is coming. He should not know. We should not know. But that should keep you check. Every day you are ready for his coming. Every day you are ready for his coming. Where that puts you then, you build an altar of worship. Worship every day. Worship every day. That's why the Bible says in Galatians chapter 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ live in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Amen? An expression of the fact that this girl, all her living now, is no longer to please herself. All her living now is waiting the day they will knock at the door. It could be early morning, it could be during the day, it could be the night. Nobody knows the time, the hour, nothing until that knock happens. Now my question to you, you are the bride of Jesus. He's the groom. If he knocks today, are you ready? 
What keeps you ready is continuous worship. Continuous worship is what keeps you ready. Continuous worship, if you read the scripture, Romans, continuous worship. That's why the Bible says, the final one, it says, this is your true and proper worship. Your true and proper worship. Philippians 1, 20 to 21. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ will be exalted in my body. Why body? Everything your flesh do, now Christ has to be exalted in your body. Christ said, no liquor, no liquor. <laughs> he should be exalted in your body. Christ said, no gossip, no gossip. Even if my mouth is itchy, no. No mouth, you will not send me to hell. I refuse it. Even if your eye want to go to places that they should not go, no eye. That's why the Bible says, if your eye calls you to sin, pluck it out because hell is no better. Pluck the eye. The Bible says, go to heaven with one eye than to hell with two. Mm, these are mysteries. These are mysteries. God say any part of your life that causes you to sin, he say chop it off. Chop it off. I'm not saying go and use a knife now. That's not going to help you. But what's going to help you is discipline that part. Discipline that part. Discipline that part. Whatever part, I, whatever it is, whatever part, you know this part will lead me to hell. It's just two minutes or three or four. I won't die. But I discipline it. I discipline it. Because I'm a bride. I don't know when the groomsman appears. I discipline it. Today, and let me tell you, church, the result of this lifestyle is only an attraction because everybody we want to be with you. Everybody we want to be with you. This is when we become true evangelists. You're talking about something you believe in. You're living a life. I will always say to people, dig whatever you want to dig. I don't have two lives, secret and public, no way. I don't. It's a pain. I can't be two people. I must be one. I must be one. Anyone you see here is the one you see everywhere. I must be one. I must be one. I have, you can knock at my house any time of the day and come through. There is nothing there to hide. Because it's one life. It's one life. Now behave yourself. Someone is coming. It's not a life. 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 You don't need to be ready to go anywhere. You should wake up and go. Because you are every day ready. That's why living a simple life is the best. We become effective soul winners, effective evangelists, effective effective and it is a process I don't want you to go nail yourself because you have done some wrong it is a process but understand it is a living sacrifice process it is a process no one thing remember one thing if sin gets you in the entrance sin should not get you in going out repent straight away sin brings you in repent straight away pursue righteousness because one of these things will happen you will say something, you will do something, you will act some way. It will always happen because understand the flesh as well is at work. 
your flesh is at work. But when your flesh puts you into something, pursue righteousness. Today, we've already spoken, the gateway is receiving Jesus. That's the gateway. That's the gateway. Receiving life. If you are in this room tonight, this, this morning or afternoon now, and you've never received Jesus in your life, you have never made this, and in, everything I've explained here will not work for you if you don't receive Christ by decision or choice. It will not work for you. Christ in you, Christ in you is what will bring all of this. Christ in you will bring all of this. Yesterday I led him, I mean, not yesterday, but Wednesday I led him, a, a beautiful lady, you know, received Jesus Christ. Her only concern was, I'm not living a good life. I know I'm not living. I say, let's start from zero. Start by giving your life first. Don't worry about whether you're going to live. A, don't worry, put that on the side. But I want you to, to be sure that the decision you are making today is from your heart and you choose to follow Christ. The rest we will deal with it at some point. But today, just if you don't want to give your life today, I say I'm not forcing you. But if you are giving it today, it should be by choice. She said, I choose. I said, okay, now we can start. If you are in this room today, Maybe you've never given your life to Jesus by intention to say, today it is my decision, not because my mom brought me, not because I saw my parents go to church, or because I am now, you know, part of this church, I've been here for so long, but I have never intentionally given my life to Jesus. But today I want to make this intention. I want you to give me a wave. You want to intentionally today give your life to Jesus by intention. That today is my intention. This is my choice I'm making. I want to give my life to Jesus. Give me a wave. Meaning we have all given our lives to Jesus Christ. Which means this is for us. Everything shared here today is for us. But I want to say this today. If you are in this room. And your struggle is that living sacrifice aspect. That's your struggle. The living sacrifice. A struggle. A struggle. My heart truly wants to live for God. But my body is the problem. And I don't want you to feel condemned. If you look at the writings of Paul, Paul once said it. He said, there are things in my body I struggle. But I have trusted the Lord. If you are in this place today and you want to say, God, there's a struggle in my body. I've tried on my own many times. I can't break free. I don't even know how to break free, but I want to surrender that today and I'm not going to fight it. Just surrender it today. Help me to deal with it. Give me a wave. Or not even a wave. I will, I will ask you to come to the altar because the altar is for holy people. So people who truly want to be transformed, and they know that they cannot do it on their own, but only God can help them. It's a complete surrender and a complete obedience. Knowing the truth that God, I truly want to live for you with no doubt. I'm seeking this. But in my own, I cannot do anything. But God, you are the only one that can help me. And I'm not ashamed that I'm depending and trusting in you. Come to the altar. I have come here many, many times for these things. There are things I just know that I cannot deal with myself. I know that. And I can't be proud about it. I can't fix it. It's only God who fixes it. It's only God who fixes it. Let me tell you, there are certain things, if you could fix it by now, you are done. But you can't by yourself. It's sad that you cannot. Some of us, it could be an anger issue. You have tried everything. Battling rejection, this addiction, whatever it is, you tried. No way. But today you are saying to God, God, I'm coming. I'm not going to fight this, for I have done it so many times and never succeeded. But I'm coming today. All I want, God, is for you to help me. And I'm willing to submit to this. The elders are here.
they will pray for you. The Bible says that the prayers of, the, of, of those who agree avails much more. That's what is here. Come. Come. You don't know what the altar can do for you. You don't know what the altar can do for you. You don't know what the altar can do for you. The Bible says that God, what God is having in mind for you, you cannot understand, you cannot imagine. God got deep things for you. But until you break free from those things, until you break free, until you break free, until you break free. And this is what the altar is all about. Completely coming and surrendering to God and saying, God, I surrender. I surrender, God. I surrender, God. I surrender, I surrender, I surrender. I surrender that struggle. I surrender that flesh. I surrender it, God. And I'm truly coming. I'm coming. This is me coming to you, God, and saying, God, help me. This is me coming, God, and saying, God, help me just like to bless you before I can leave you. I pray that the Lord will honor you. I pray that the Lord will increase you. The Lord will bless you. And I pray that God will give you the grace to accelerate into whatever he is calling you into doing. I pray that the grace and the glory of God will settle upon you this year. I pray that the Lord will give you an advantage over your enemy. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I decree in your life that God himself will go before you. I decree that your going out and your coming in this year shall be blessed. I decree that the Lord will honor you and he will set his glory upon you. I prophesy that God will set a pathway before you and he will make path straight before you. And I speak that any weapon that is formed against you will not prosper. And I pray that any tongue that rises against you will be judged by God himself. I pray that crooked paths before you will be made straight. The Lord bless you and the Lord enlarge in your territory and increase your coast. May the Lord himself shine his continent upon you. May his face radiate upon you. And may the Lord be gracious to you. Thank you so much for being with us today. I truly honor and I appreciate your time. And I'm looking forward to seeing you another time. God bless you. Bye.